Today on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation with literary blogger Maud Newton, founder of ModNewton.com. Maud Newton is the literary blogger behind ModNewton.com, a showcase for, and I quote, links, amusements, politics, and rants. She founded the site in 2002, making it one of the oldest literary blogs, or if I want to sound a little hipper, I'll use the phrase lit blogs, around. Maud, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So what prompted the founding of your literary blog back in the days when there weren't too many examples around? What made you think this might be a good idea at the time when people were doing it? Well, to be honest, the blog didn't start as a purely literary blog. Um, and I don't actually view it as a, as a purely literary blog now, although I am known as a book blogger. I started because I was bored at work, like so many bloggers, I think, especially of that era. And I discovered a number of blogs, including one uh, called crabwalk.com, which was just um, a Dallas Morning News reporter's sort of ramblings about various cultural and political things that interested him. And then I happened upon bookslut.com and Layla Lalamy's Moorish Girl and the Literary Saloon, all of which were some of the earliest literary blogs. And I thought, well, you know, I can do this. I can just write about cultural things and political things that interest me. And so I did. And then over time, I think, particularly, uh, I, I'm a fairly political person, and I was very upset when the war started the year following. And I was blogging about that a lot, and then I I decided to distract myself by obsessively blogging about books. That was, if I have my facts correct, the impetus for you turning off the comments of your blog, which is kind of an unusual thing in the blogosphere, right? Well, I'm not sure that it's unusual to not have comments. I think there are bloggers who don't. But I, I agree that it's probably unusual for someone to just sort of have a moment at which he or she decides, okay, that's it. But, but that's what I did. I decided, well, you know what, this is my blog, and basically it's a dictatorship, not a democracy. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you would like to comment, you, i.e. anyone, would like to comment um, on your own blog or send hate mail, that's fine. I think because I have a sort of southern background, I felt a compulsion to respond to each comment and... Eventually, I just decided I didn't want that kind of pressure. Were you just having all of your time eaten up by the need to res respond to these critiques of whatever you thought about the war at the time or whatever you thought about whatever? I was, but even, you know, the sort of positive things that people would say, you know, oh, I love your blog, smiley face, you know. <laughs> I, would, I would actually sit around and think, you know, this person is going to think I'm really snobbish if I don't respond to this, but it's not interesting for other people to read it. And I just decided it was really taking up way too much of my energy. And I am very interested in having discussions with people and even debates with people if I'm particularly interested. But I'm, I'm not, I don't want to feel compelled to respond uh, to, to every single person's thought. And, you know, I, I think uh, Layla Lalami, again, her blog used to be called Moorish Girl. Now it's called LaylaLalami.com. And I think she also, at a certain point, just decided not to have comments. And Jessa Crispin of Book Slut never has. Uh, but then, of course, someone like um, Mark Sarvis of The Elegant Variation does a great job with his comments. And enjoys sort of getting in there and debating with people. One of the pieces of biographical data that always comes up whenever you're discussed, or at least frequently comes up, is that you made the jump from the world of law to the what I assume is equally lucrative world of literary blogging. Now, what caused that? <laughs> 
Well, um, actually, I, I don't make my living from my blog. I have a day job. I work in legal publishing. Again, I think because my day job was just that, a sort of office job that I'm good at, but that doesn't necessarily satisfy every impulse I have and doesn't address many of my interests. You know, because I have that kind of day job, I think I was more drawn to this sort of possibility of just putting my thoughts out into the world and reading other people's thoughts. And in the blog itself, you will refer to, I believe the term is Cubeville or something along those lines you use to describe the environment in which you work. And that struck me as a bit of a contrast with a lot of day job having bloggers, which is most bloggers, of course, in that you actually do... I don't know if I want to say rag on where you work, but you, you do express displeasure about certain elements about the place that you work. Now, a lot of bloggers are very scared to do that. Why aren't you? Well, that's a good question. For one thing, I, I don't go by the name Maud at work. Um, it's actually a nickname. My actual legal first name is out on the Internet. It's not a secret. It's Rebecca. But most of my coworkers actually don't know about the site. And... We, we have a company policy uh, that maintaining a blog is okay as long as we don't give away proprietary information or say things that, you know, I mean, I, I assume if I were the sort of person who engaged in stereotyping or something, um, that would be problematic. But, you know, I think that disenchantment with one's day job is fairly common. And I don't think that I've said anything on my site that would do anything more than maybe hurt someone's feelings. I want to talk a little bit more about the contrast between the blog in its earliest days and the blog as it has evolved today. Now, what was it like then, and how is that different from today? Well, I've definitely gone through different phases with the site. Uh, as I say, there was a point at which I was, I was kind of obsessively blogging and very, very aware of the fact that I had developed an audience and that people were coming to the site and expecting me to put things up there. And I find that when I start thinking in that way, I really don't enjoy it very much. So I try to remain mindful of my initial impulse, which was just to put something out there to talk about things honestly, to entertain myself and other people who share my interests, to let the blog sort of change over time. And, and it has. You know, my preoccupations have definitely mutated. How did you know you were getting a large audience? How, how quickly did that audience build in the in the early days before blogs were even popular was when you started. How did you go about building the audience, or did you actively build it? Did you just put stuff out there and word spread? I didn't really build it. Uh, I didn't ever do anything consciously, you know, apart from providing content, as they say. You know, I never sort of sent out notes and never really have sent out notes saying, hi, I wrote a post about this, or... Hi, I have this website. Would you please link to it? It's just not really my style to do something like that. I think when I started, there were very few of us blogging about culture. There was a site called The Minor Fall, The Major Lift, done by a guy named Alex Balk, who subsequently went to Gawker and is now, I believe, the online editor of Radar. And we would just kind of joke back and forth sometimes, and it was a much, much more informal sort of endeavor at that point, because I don't think any of us ever expected that anyone would know or care what we were saying. That changed rather suddenly for me when, in the fall of 2003, New York Magazine asked me if I would like to be part of an article about bloggers. And I, I thought, oh, my God, New York Magazine knows about my blog. How weird. Within months after that, you know, there were a number of stories about bloggers, including a, a fairly negative one written by Jennifer Howard of the Washington Post. At the time, she was at the Washington Post. And 
It was about how bloggers had created this insular world that was very negative about the mainstream media and very cliquish. It was all kind of a surprise, but I guess it was the newspaper articles that made me aware of the building audience. What is your reaction to the conversation that goes on and on and on and will never be resolved about the worthwhileness of blogs, whether blogs are good or they're trash, or the question about what blogs are for? You seem to, you seem to have lifted yourself above that whole fray. Would I be false in assuming that? Well, I find it kind of an uninteresting conversation, to be honest. And I think my answer is implicit in the fact that I continue to blog. Obviously, I don't think it's um, a, a waste of time or I wouldn't continue to do it. Well, you know, I mean, sometimes it is a waste of time, but, <laughs> but I enjoy it. And I don't feel compelled to defend myself and I don't feel compelled to try to explain why I am culturally relevant. And honestly, I think that this meme has to sort of disappear as more and more uh, media outlets start maintaining blogs, many of which are written by their critics and their journalists. I'm not sure that, that they can have it both ways, that they can bash bloggers and then have blogs. I think it's an, an inconsistent position. And I will say, too, that I, I think there was a point at which people were blaming, particularly in the book world, people were blaming bloggers for the cutbacks at book reviews. And as I pointed out last year, you know, anyone who makes that sort of connection, I think, really needs to take a course in basic logic <laughs> because I don't think that bloggers are in any way responsible for budgeting at newspapers. I don't think that newspapers have been saying, oh, there are these blogs, therefore we're going to cut back. I think there are two unrelated things. You've also seemed to stay, at least on the sidelines, or maybe almost entirely out of the conversation that I tend to bring up whenever I'm talking to lit bloggers because they tend to post on it, is the quote-unquote crisis in book reviewing and whether book reviewing will survive. That's not, doesn't seem to have been quite an area of interest for you, is it? As someone who loves books, I'm in favor of book reviews continuing and I'm in favor of any and all discussion about books that anyone finds useful or relevant. I'm not sure that I think that blogs, again, I, I don't see a causal link, as, as we former lawyers say, <laughs> between the shrinking of book reviews, the death of some literary publications and whatnot, and blogging. I, I just don't think that the one thing is causing the other. So I, I'm not really sure what to say about it. I mean, I, I just continue to read things about books that interest me and talk about them. Now, ModNewton.com is known as a literary blog. That's what I always see it referred to as. But as you mentioned, you started about not necessarily thinking of it as a literary blog, and maybe today not necessarily thinking of what you're doing as literary blogging, at least in terms of something that restrictive. Now, how do you think you got that label attached to you, just because you happen to talk a lot about books? Well, I think so. And as I say, there was a time in 2003 when I very self-consciously chose to focus on books. I decided that this would be a good distraction from what was going on in the world. And then once I made that shift, I was very aware as time went on of people's expectation that I would continue to talk about books. And I think for a while I did feel a little bit constrained by that. But again, when I felt that constraint, I enjoyed it less. And, you know, when I allow myself to do things like post about my, you know, my ancestors or just other random things that fascinate me, like tax law, <laughs> not exactly a topic that most people find of burning interest, I just enjoy it more. Again, it's not something that is directly a profit-making endeavor, so I might as well have fun. 
Now, those posts about your own heritage, I found that very fascinating. I guess that you do them at all, because it's a fairly bold move for a blogger who's gotten one subject associated with her to start posting photos that she's found of her family and previous generations. How did you even get the notion to start doing that? I don't know. I was just interested, and I just decided to do it. And I think years ago, too, even when I was known as a book blogger, I did more writing about my family, about my parents and my childhood and whatnot. This seemed in some way like a continuation of that from my perspective. What kind of response do you get to those posts? I'm very curious about this. I get mixed responses. I think some people would like it if I would never do another one. And I think there are people who come to the blog primarily for that kind of thing. It's an interesting range of people who read the site. Now, back to matters literary. One of the things that lit bloggers tend to say about what they like about their vocation, avocation, whatever they've made lit blogging, is that they can champion their favorite books or their favorite authors that don't get to their minds enough attention. Now, I know some of the names that I will probably ask you about if you don't mention them, but what are some of the, well, who are some of the authors and what are some of the works you have best been able to get the word out about with ModNewton.com? Again, it's very difficult to quantify the effect that my championing of any particular author has had. One example that comes to mind is Kate Christensen, whose novels I devoured last summer in one great gulp, and whose uh, most recent book, Her Force, The Great Man, was more or less ignored when it came out. Recently, she's won the... Penn Faulkner Prize, I believe. So that was great. But um, I, I felt glad that I was able to talk about her and do a very brief interview with her and just champion her work. And I was also able to recommend her book to, well, all of her books to, for instance, my friend Terry Teachout, who maintains a blog at About Last Night and who, as I predicted he would, fell in love with her work. My friend Carrie Fry, who used to have a site called Tingle Alley, but now also posts that about last night. Mark, I know, enjoyed The Great Man. I also recommended the books to my friend Lizzie Skernick, who has an infrequently updated site now called The Old Hag. Basically, I proselytized both online and in email and in person. I don't know whether any of that made a significant difference in terms of sales, but I I was happy to spread the word. When The Great Man came out, I actually tried to get Kate Christensen on the show, but I got a response that she was busy writing the next book, and I said, okay. But then I saw that the book had won the award, and I thought, well, she's just going to get a whole lot busier now, but I'm going to keep trying. How was your interview with her? How did you enjoy it, just so I know? Well, I I interviewed her in email. Oh, different story. And... I don't. I haven't actually done too many audio interviews with authors. I did one with Shalom Oslander last year, but that's not something that I've focused on. She was wonderful. She's great, and, and I hope you can have her on the show. Weirdly, <laughs> she and I lived in the same neighborhood and still have not met one another, and I've now <laughs> moved out of that neighborhood and I think now it's it's actually, we like each other very much and we periodically have flare-ups of correspondence, but we just really, I think at this point it's actually become awkward that we haven't met each other. <laughs> Living in the same neighborhood yet not meeting, I, is this like the time I should make some corny only in New York joke or something? <laughs> I think so. I think I think that's that's true. Only in New you York. Take, right, exactly. You take these things for granted when you live here, I think. I have a feeling that Kate and I would really like each other, but I I often actually avoid meeting authors I like, especially authors whose work I really respond to because there have been times and and no, I will not identify those times. Um, when I've met authors and been a little bit disappointed on meeting them just because I had built them up so much in my mind. And even though they were perfectly nice, they didn't quite match the grand image I had. 
there is always that disconnect. You never quite know, based on how much you like a work, whether you're going to like a person. Although, have you had the experience of disliking a person's work and then liking the person? Because that's really weird. Oh, absolutely. That happens not infrequently. I never know how to deal with that. Yes, yes, it is. Well, I don't know how to deal with it either, and I'm not sure I have any any pithy summary about the ultimate meaning of it, but it, it can be awkward. One of the authors that you have been a pretty tireless booster of on the blog, and one that you've also met, is Rupert Thompson. And he's not a guy that I know a lot of people who have read, so I'm hoping maybe you could sell some listeners on Rupert Thompson. I worship Rupert Thompson, I, I think it's fair to say, as an author. He is, is a, an extraordinary talent, and his work is definitely not for everyone. As I've said on the blog, I think one reason he's not particularly well-known is that his books are not really... There are common themes. Obsession is a common theme. The books are often very dark. Frequently they have a greater or lesser focus on, on sex, but it's in a very sort of blunt yet beautifully written way. So I, I think he's just, you know, he's sort of dabbled in satire, he's dabbled in fantastical stuff, in futuristic stories. My favorite of his books, or at least the most beautifully structured, is probably the Book of Revelation, which is a story that sounds incredibly gimmicky. It's about a man, a ballet dancer, who is abducted by three women and held by them and forced to have sex with them in various twisted ways over the course of, uh, of the time that they're holding him. It, you know, when I read the book, I was really impressed with the way that he had rendered this and made it so believable. But I kind of thought, well, that was great, but there's nowhere he can go with this now after this first section. You know, it was, it was a really well done piece of transgressive fiction, but... I can't imagine that the rest of the book will be of any interest whatsoever. Where do you go from there? Right, and I was wrong. It was about the effects on his life of this experience. Of course, um, the few people he tried to tell about it didn't really believe him because it's such an implausible scenario for a man uh, to be in a, a situation where he's forced to have sex with women, you know, of course, the, the typical reaction would be, oh, poor you, right? But um, so, so it's a very interesting and psychologically complex work. But again, it's not the kind of book that I could go out and give to every single one of my friends, even those who share my tastes, because it's a, it's a very particular kind of story. And then another of my favorite books of his is Divided Kingdom, which is a story about the United Kingdom being divided up according to the four humors. So everyone takes a personality test, and then <laughs> children are taken from their families and reassigned to, you know, the, the sanguines are together, and the melancholic personalities are in another quadrant. And... Um, some people found it, you know, just so implausible as to be ridiculous, but I found it really poignant and deeply moving. Is it the case with all of his books that you've read then that he takes these premises which are unusual, let's say, and just puts them out there with full, solid commitment? I think that is a perfect description of what he does. It's a matter of... I've, I fully believe that almost every person who reads would like one of his books. It's just a question of which one. And I would invite your listeners to email me and tell me what they like, and I will, you know, I will take the risk of trying to personally recommend one. But his most recent book, uh, Death of a Murderer, is really a more standard story in, in certain respects. And... Um, I did admire it, but it's probably my least favorite of his works. It did not have the same, for me, the same sort of stampeding magical quality as much of his earlier fiction does. 
Now, as long as we're talking about the mechanics of writing novels, I'm going to ask you, because journalistic workmanship requires that I do, the TGBIW, and you can tell what that stands for to the audience. You can explain where that fits into your life. Oh, my goodness. The godforsaken book I'm writing. Oh, yes. I, I forgot that I had come up with that. I'll, I'll have to start using that abbreviation again. <laughs> yes, I have been working on a novel for many years, and I am continuing to work on it. And I, I recently realized that at least half of what I've done is completely misguided, oh. which was both a, a horrible thing to realize and a good thing to realize, because I, I now know why I've, I've been having so much difficulty with it. But there's really nothing more boring than listening to a would-be novelist sort of discuss the mechanics of why, of why a book in progress isn't working. One thing that I have found interesting, though, is I realized about a year ago that I've been sort of hoarding various strange incidents from my life to use and twist in the novel. And I have known for many, many years since studying with the formidable Harry Cruz when I was all of 19 years old that, you know, obviously fiction is a separate thing from life, that all events in a work of fiction have to, you know, actually work in that context, um, and that one should not try to cram one's life into a book. But I have, I think, subconsciously been holding on to some of the stranger things and darker things that have happened to me in the hope of using those in this book, which is, is very much not an, a work of autobiography, but is about someone who has had some of the same experiences that I have. And in the last year, I've realized that it's actually probably a good idea for me to go ahead and tell some of those stories in nonfiction in order to sort of detach myself from them as material and be able to consider whether or not some of those details will actually work in this book. So for instance, I recently, <laughs> to my surprise, I recently won second place in a narrative love story contest with an essay about a, a terrible relationship that I had with a guy I dated in college. And it, it actually, I'm, I'm kind of terrified that I've put this much of myself out there and that it will soon be appearing on the internet. But I'm also really glad from the standpoint of my novel that I have disengaged from this particular set of situations and can now move forward and depict my narrator's own relationship that she has without sort of trying to cram in certain juicy details from my life. So telling your own story, literally autobiographically, as a piece of nonfiction, maybe gives you some distance, but it also gives you, you might say, a little bit of a trial run to put it into words before you put it into words differently for a different character living a different life in a fictional world? I think so. I, I, I think that, you know, it's a very counterintuitive thing, but getting it out there, sort of writing it in, in a completely truthful way just enables me to have that be done and now to take anything that might be useful from that and incorporate it into this character's situation. When I was last talking to Mark Sarvis of The Elegant Variation, who we've mentioned, it was uh, down at Dutton's, which is now sadly closed, in Los Angeles. He oh, was, he was so sad about that. Well, so was I. We were crying together. He mentioned that the role of, the triple role, I should say, of blogger, of critic, and of novelist, it's got, it's got some trickiness to it. How do you plan to handle that role when your novel's done and out there? Well, to be honest with you, I try not to think about it. <laughs> um, I, I try to just be honest and candid. You know, if I'm going to talk about a book, I, tr I just try to be as candid as possible. 
and I I feel I'm sure you know it, if I ever do finish this novel and it is published, you know, I fully anticipate that there will be people who will hate it, hate it both because it's a book that I, Maud Newton, the blogger, have written, and because they just don't like the subject matter or the way it's executed. And I think that's that's fine. You know, they, they can react however they will. I, I have an attitude. I guess it's the same attitude that I have about my blog. I don't. I don't really feel the need to defend my blog. I don't really feel the need to answer general charges about the uselessness of blogs. And I'm sure it will be a very dif different kind of thing to have a book out there, to have more personal writing out there, and have people respond to that. But I think that the blog is a good trial run, to be honest. The blog, once again, is modnewton.com. Maud Newton, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thank you very much for having me. Our music is composed by Ben Althaus. Check out his website, Ben Althaus, that's B-E-N-A-L-T-H-O-U-S-E, dot com. For more information and our online show archive, visit colinmarshallradio.com. <laughs>